I reply to your email, Marco. Maybe I didn't. Hold on one moment. My daughter just had to tell me something. Um, my Marco email. Massey, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Other Marco. Your email? No, I received. I replied to your email. You I'm recall? Sorry. Yeah, I've been out of town and I things got buried. I'll reply. All right. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, right. I just remembered now. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Okay, so, um, can, Lauren, can we hear you? Hey there. Hi. Hopefully your reception is better this time. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere this time. I'm at home. <laughs> Great. Well, we don't have a dedicated leader for this discussion. So um, I, I would be happy to return to our original intention from the first talks of holding a space for what wants to arise from the depths or from the heights or the, um, uh, the, the supermental, uh, if we can allow that. And we can begin with a, a meditation I have a bell here, so I could time us. And then uh, after that, I'll, um, I, I won't uh, begin with any particular remarks, uh, unless they arise, of course. I do have some thoughts about these chapters, and I think there are some interesting themes we could explore, but let's see what wants to arise after we tune in. Sound good? Sounds good. All right.
Well, just to review where we are in the book, according to the schedule anyway, uh, whether or not we're individually all uh, on the same page, we're in part two. And last week, we talked about the chapters having to do with the cosmic illusion. And this week, we have three chapters. Chapter 7 on the knowledge and the ignorance. Chapter 8 on memory, self-consciousness, and the ignorance. And chapter 9 on memory, ego, and self-experience. And just to um, highlight what I think the transition is from last week to this week, at least as far as the text, is that in the last two chapters, Aurobindo was arguing against, I think, this metaphysics of the world of the cosmos being an illusion. Uh, that he's arguing against the, the notion that there is a fundamental ignorance, which is equal to or greater than uh, the capacity for knowledge uh, of being or knowledge of the divine. And where he left us in the last chapter was with the uh, assertion that in order to understand how it is that we have a universe at all and how it is that we can uh, have many kinds of experiences that are yet not the same as that experience or that ultimate experience of being, consciousness, ananda, and so forth, we have to look at the knowledge and the, and the ignorance. And so I think this... Uh, chapter in particular um, speaks to or expresses uh, the point that you made, Matteo, uh, when we began book two, which is that this is um, more a book about epistemology. And so the question, I think, or one of the questions that I have uh, with respect to these chapters that we're moving into this week is, what does Aurobindo mean by knowledge? And what does he mean by ignorance? And can we identify uh, those aspects of being uh, in this moment of consciousness that we're in now? Uh, because I think that's part of what Aurobindo is calling us to do or is uh, saying is in the nature of the knowledge. It has to do with uh, actual experience or direct consciousness. Uh, but I would love to uh, hear what we all think about um, about those questions or whatever else uh, is on is on our minds our mind Well, if no one wants to go, I'll go. Um, I'm looking at the chapter, Memory, Ego, and Self-Experience. And I'm looking at the quotation from the Prasna Upanishad. Hear this God, the mind, in its dream experiences again and again, what once was experienced, what has been seen, and what has not been seen, what has been heard, and what has not been heard, what has been experienced, and what has not been experienced, what is and what is not, all it sees, it is all and sees. So, uh, I, thought, I thought this last paragraph of this chapter was just stunning. And of course, I'm not gonna read it all because it's just too big. Um, but I think he contrasts throughout the chapter, a surface, a surface existence with a depth, and he uses the metaphor of the ocean quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and his favorite metaphor of the veil being covering up and lifting, this sort of 
um, amnesia, followed by remembering, followed by partial amnesia, followed by partial remembering. So I think he plays off this kind of sleep wake, um, half asleep, half awake kind of experience quite a bit. And I, I and I think he's presenting a he I think he's a model he's modeling himself. And I believe he's inviting each of us to model our, our own experience. We all have a model of the world. We we have a model of the self. There is a relationship between the world and the self. We most of us do not spend a whole lot of time unpacking this. <laughs> But I think our author has spent an enormous amount of time investigating the, the, the subtleties and the minutia and the interstices and the cracks and the crevices and the black holes and the illuminations. So I believe that um, it's a calling to do, your, to do your work, not to just take his word for it. I think maybe his, some of his disciples may have done that, as most disciples do, is to think, oh, well, he's done the heavy lifting. All I have to do is worship. <clears throat> and I, I think this is, I think he may have taken on some of the trappings of the, of the traditional guru, because he did run an ashram with a mother and all that. Um, but I think he was adapting to, you know, the, the, the cultural norms um, that, uh, you know, sort of um, constrained and enabled. So anyway, I had a dream, and I had a dream following the last um, discussion that we had, um, and I had this little diagram. You'll have to pardon me for repeating this if you, you already saw this, um, the, that emerged out of my, the previous encounters I had with this text. And these are, this diagram is an, my attempt to model my own, myself, my world, and perhaps in this uh, attempt something about our world can also start to emerge as I believe the mother and Arabinda were trying to do but I got this I was trying to I'm sort of just taking in what I'm getting the information at the level of the information and the, also the, the concepts that he's creating and also he's drawing upon this rich tradition which I'm not familiar with um, but, but there's also the affective zones uh, that he's drawing upon too so this little, this little diagram came out of that last adventure. I have a, I have a one to A, B, C, D, E, F, and a G. And all of these different spaces um, have different kinds of information, affects. And I mentioned that A, this is, C contains A and B, which are sensory motor. So A is swimming, B is, no, no, B is swimming, A is riding a bike. C is, has access to A and B and a whole lot more. This is just a, a rough sketch. Then I focused on D, which is lucid dreaming, and E, which is out of body experience, and that D and E, are embraced by F, which has access to all of these psychic experiences. So C works with the physical, the sensory motor, cause and effect. F is working with the interior and, and is working with the psychic. And, and different kinds of phenomena that are available to F that are not available to C. But as I explored this, uh, uh, the last thing I remember I said is that the ego, that the, that the psychic self should be coordinating, not the ego exclusively. And I would say C is more egoic since it's dealing with an external objective reality that can be shared with others in that external objective reality. What I didn't have much of is G, G which which embraces A, B, D, E, C, and F, which embraces both the psychic and the sensory motor physical objective, ego-dominated dimensions. 
And I had this experience of a dream. My, my big question, I suppose, is from G, what does G know about all of these other spaces? So I had this dream, and um, I'll tell you a little bit of the content, but what was important about it is the, re the, the kind of relationship that was uh, expressed, and I think this chapter is about expression, about memory, ego, and self-expression. So I'm, I'm, I'm walking down a road, it's by a highway, it's after some sort of disaster, it looks like a, you know, there are old refrigerators and computer parts and parts of cars, you know, a real junkyard along the side of this road. And I see an old man whom I recognize as my father who died all oh, about five years ago. And I, I hated my father. I think he detested me as well. So it was a very troubled relationship. But somehow in the dream, I participated with him in something that um, sort of amazed me. I had, a, I had tape across my face and I pulled it off. And I told him that I know that he tried to do some good things for me, but that because of the violence that he committed to me and others, I was not able to receive the good, the little bit of good <laughs> that he was able to share with me and that he wanted to share. But I felt and I didn't have to say much because we were in this telepathic rapport. And I felt his, I felt what we did share and we were acknowledging was grief. He, it didn't work out the way he wanted to. It didn't work out the way I wanted to. But we, we acknowledged this grief. And somehow there was a modulation of the affective tone that did not spill over into those ego-driven very conservative, times chopped up in a sequence. That ego that tends to preserve those hostilities, both his ego and my ego, was I think put into, it was held in check so that something else could emerge that was different. Um, and I felt, I felt my whole um, dream body and that dream world and the physical ego world that we had shared, I knew that was not the world that we were in in that moment. But that I think this, this G space, what it knows about all those other spaces, it knows that ego history, it knows the psychic, and it can play at the boundaries and it knows a whole lot more because I think this G space opens up into a vast ocean, <clears throat> Sat Chidananda perhaps. But I think this G space can coordinate and co-coordinate with these other spaces. But I think when we leave the ego in check, in charge, it will funnel all of this through this fragmented and exterior and, um, and, and using a kind of time that which is very successive and very chopped up. And I think this and the sense of time that G has is a, it's, a, it's a very different kind of time. So that's the kind of uh, way I'm working with this. And I believe that um, it's psychological, it's affective, it's social. Here I am talking about all this with you guys. And I, um, I applaud all of our efforts at coming together to really absorb the nutrients of this immense text. For me, it's having intensity is amplified because I can feel the questions I have of the text in my ordinary sort of waking state. And then I can see going into the subliminal zones those liminal zones that we go to every night when we go to sleep or when we go into our everyday trance states or our reveries. And I believe there is an integrative capacity, which is much faster than, than our ego, that can hold the, these kinds of dynamics. 
So this is a sort of personal reading, but I also think, you know, I could go paragraph by paragraph and just underline, uh, you know, stuff that he, these incredible gems that he just sort of offers you. And um, so I, I think it's a, a great opportunity to just read this for the first time uh, at whatever level I can. And when I get to the end of the book, maybe I'll go back and reread the sections that uh, I am most attracted to, as well as read other works of his. So um, I, I do think this is a, a marvelous read. <laughs> I mean, to me, this is, a, I couldn't believe it. At the library, I was so absorbed by this book that they turned the lights out. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, well, what's going on? They said, we're closing the library. And I said, you are? Said, wait, wait a minute. And I wrapped them myself and I apologized because usually I, get, I, I leave early before they close. But I was as enwrapped in this as I had been in any kind of novel or sci-fi piece I've ever read. So I hope you guys are having as good a time as I am. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, John. I appreciate uh, if it even takes any vulnerability to be personal like that. I appreciate that. It's uh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, I didn't tell you something else. In the dream, when the right when the dream ended, I heard a voice say the word Gettysburg. And when the, when I heard that word Gettysburg, I was like, "What's going on here?" And then I saw some scenes from a battle. Um, during the Civil War and there were bayonets and there was enormous violence. And I woke up and I wrote the dream down. Two hours later, I had a conference call and I think Doug was there and Marco was there and our friend Jeffrey was there. And Jeffrey in this conference call talked about an experience he had at Gettysburg. And when I heard that word Gettysburg, I went, oh, I just had a dream about Gettysburg. So I think this is something else that the G, that G has access to. And I believe G can can take a word like Gettysburg because he knows that I was going to hear it the next morning <laughs> in a conference call. And it can it can be a clue. It's like, okay, maybe you didn't get everything, maybe you got a little bit, but we're just gonna leave these little clues. And I think this this kind of tradition is very old, especially in, in Tibetan Buddhism, where uh, uh, a person will have a dream about some some um, prophet or some teacher who leaves clues behind in the landscape so they can go to a place and dig it up and find um, a symbol or a, an image or a piece of pottery or some sort of something that uh, uh, the teacher had left behind uh, but with the expectation that it would be found through this kind of uh, extrasensory perception so I think in our in these own little in our own little uh, these little gestures, I think, that are that are coming from these uh, other levels of our being, we of course are not paying a whole lot of attention to because we're so busy, we're such busy people with so many things to do. But I think if we pay even a little bit of attention, we can be vastly rewarded for our effort. So, thank you. Uh, maybe I may say something about, since you take up the um, fact, the dream, what dreams are for Sri Aurobindo. I was desperately searching 
where he described this, I remember that he described somewhere what dreams are. Uh, <laughs> as usual, when I search for some citation, I never find it. So I try to explain it by my words, because it's interesting what you say, uh, that in a sort of dream state, the ego tends to not go away, but have a bit less influence usually. Maybe not in all dreams. I don't know if it's a general rule, but in many dreams, uh, the ego uh, tends to um, play a secondary role, not so, such a primary role as in the waking state. And there in that state, we realize things that otherwise in a waking state normally usually we don't realize or don't in intuitively understand and there is a very a wonderful passage of Sri Aurobindo in the life divine somewhere where he describes that <clears throat> dreams are a sort of transcription of our existence on other planes of existence but we are not in direct contact with as this, these other planes of existence because it's all filtered out by the mind. The mind is only a, a tool of part, partial knowledge and it filters all these things out. When we are in a dreaming state, the ego uh, is less powerful and this filtering becomes less uh, less uh, decisive, so to speak. And he, he, in that passage, he also uh, in, uh, indirectly answers the, the um, objection that the dreaming state is less real than the waking state. And he says that the waking state is exactly as unreal as the dreaming state something that it's very difficult to, when I read this for the first time, I was a little bit skeptic. I said, for me, the waking state has some, this concreteness. We live in a world which is more substantial, more concrete, more, it's made of hard objects. Something that we, in the dreaming state, we don't see or not, or not in this way. And there he says that in any case, also our waking state is nothing else than a particular type of filtering uh, of our existence on other planes of uh, another part and, and planes um, of existence of our soul, so to speak, our psychic. And uh, this made clear, at least to me, how in a certain sense, the dreaming state and also the waking states are nothing else than two types of illusions, different types of illusions, but both types of illusions because there is this veil of the mind which filters the truth, so to speak. If we would live in a super conscious, uh, at the supramental level, probably we will, would get indirect contact with the objects and by a process, by a knowledge, by identity, as Sri Aurobindo says. But since we are always filtering out everything with the mind, which is a sort of separative uh, knowledge, and we are justified to say that also our waking state is a state of illusion. And I like this very much because at least at a philosophical level, at an intellectual level, it explains me a lot of things why <laughs> the one state and also the other state are both illusions, but nevertheless, sometimes in the dreaming state, we get in contact with some truths that we cannot realize and not understand with uh, in, in a waking state. 
my question for you, Marco, and that was beautifully said, um, about the, the, the illusion, the dream is an illusion, the waking is an illusion. But my question is, according to whom yeah. are, is the dream and the waking state an illusion? I think it depends on if you're in the waking state or you're in the, in the dream state. If you're in a lucid dream, you may have access to much more yeah. than the dream that is an illusion as the waking state dream, as the waking state is an illusion. I think at certain levels, yes, you can call them illusions, but I think at other levels, we can see through in a transparent way and we can co-create. Mm. And I think we shouldn't be, and I don't think I, I, Aurobindo endorses the idea that we should get rid of our egos prematurely committing ourselves to nirvana <laughs> because he, I, I believe that he's doing something else in this text. Yes, this is sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, he doesn't say that we should get rid of our ego. Just the, the being must be prepared. Yes. Um, yes, but this when you are in this state of lucid dreaming and you can see through a little bit more uh, how, how can i say uh, f further away eh, so to speak uh, okay but don't you, don't you think that you can reach this state of consciousness of more lucidity and clarity also in the waking state yes yeah a big yes to that. I think that's yeah. why we're here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is, it's a good point. Yes, that's why we are here in a certain sense, yes. Well, I also have a question. If the waking state is an illusion, then presuming we're in the wake, all in the waking state right now, then we would be in an illusion right now. Yeah. That's a big assumption, though, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> but if we were aware of it being having an illusory quality, then what would be the status of that awareness? I would, I, I would say we would be moving from time as as memory as a device for linking succession which is what the ego primarily does. It organizes time according to causes and effects in a physical world that can be predicted and controlled, hopefully, so that the ego has a good day. But I think the simultaneity of the psychic being can do lots of other things. Um, and I think that's where the serendipities and the synchronicities and the, the, the odd things that go bump in the night, you know, those paranormal things or those hunches that we get on occasion that lead to something, a big learning experience. I, I think that that's, um, we need the ego and we should use the ego wisely, but the ego should not be in charge. I think the psychic being can coordinate much more effectively and ecologically than the ego can. And our modern ego is incredibly entrenched in all of our institutions as many of us have expressed the dismay at how we want to make these changes. We know we have the capacity to do that, but these, uh, you know, these, these very hardcore patterns, which are ego driven are, are stamped in all of our systems. So I think this is an adventure just to loosen up, loosen, loosen up some of these hard, uh, hardcore kind of boundaries. Because we're much more fluid and dynamic than any of us could possibly imagine. I'd like to read two aphorisms of Sri Aurobindo on the ego and transforming the ego. It's from this beautiful little writing called The Goal. And I'm taking them non sequitur just to single out these two sentences. When we have passed beyond individualizing, then we shall be real persons. Ego was the helper, ego is the bar. 
transform the divided individual into the world personality. Let all thyself be divine. This is thy goal. So no, it's not a it's not an abolish for nirvana. I just I've been thinking a little bit recently about um, just the ego and mental health really and um, how it's interesting I feel like there is a very fine line between like the evolution of the ego to that like divine self the path of like some of those people crazy on the street are probably pretty close to that more spiritual sense but like on a different side of it in a way um i don't know and for some reason i think some people are closer to that line than others more likely to go over <laughs> the edge towards insanity um and which is why I think it's like important, say, for people who are like experimenting with psychedelic drugs to be aware of that. It's it's nothing like small to mess with. Um, grounded in ourselves and, and over. Um, but in a way in which we're grounded enough that we're not going to lose like a balanced awareness or something, um, you know, because I've seen people who don't really know themselves very well take, say, like heroic doses of psychedelics and they're never really the same. Um, and yeah, I just, I think that like our a current the current like trend of spirituality and stuff a lot of the times they're like just get rid of your ego you know and they, it's really like pushed i think is like this the ego is bad that like there is a level in which the ego can be taken over and then it's bad <laughs> but that the ego is actually an important factor in our existence and in our consciousness and in our development that we need to you know utilize and you know the same like i was saying about that line can be said too with like in like finding enlightenment or like thinking in god <laughs> and there's like a difference there's people think that they're you know they see the writings and stuff that say like we're one with everything you know you're part of god and all that but that it's almost like they take it too literally or their sense of self isn't grounded enough and then it becomes this like whole big psychopathy um i think our world is really like on that line right now and it's it's interesting to watch because we see we're seeing so many horrible things happening all over the world you know and people it's like psyches breaking down and like I mean children school shootings like all of this is just it's insane um and then at the same time here we are people like us talking about how we can integrate and move forward and evolve our consciousness and I just I hope we can have more talk of that around the ego and find that balance I don't know <laughs> those are my thoughts about it Got a couple ideas going off what you said, Lauren, and then something else I want to throw in, but maybe I'll start with the uh, the story 
um, that I listened to and I really, really like by Octavia, Octavia Butler. It's called, it's just a short story um, called The Book of Martha. And it starts off uh, like a lot of her stories. Uh, she's, feels like she's in a dream in this one. She doesn't know if she's in a dream. Um, the main character, Martha, is a writer. It's, uh, it's autobiographical in a way, but she's confronted by God. But she doesn't believe it's God because it's, it's the Moses type of God with the long white hair, um, that, that type of God. And so at first she thinks, oh, this is just some silly dream. Or if, it, if it's not a dream because it really, really feels real, then this is some sort of trickster or some sort of devil figure, which she in the story didn't believe in either. But as the story progresses, she, she's given the opportunity to change the world. She's given the opportunity to to have the power to create a utopian society. And th this God figure works with her when she comes up with ideas. Well, maybe, maybe if we limit the, the population, each, each family can only have uh, two children at most. And then the God comes back and says, no, well, if we did that, that would kind of disrupt things. That would, didn't go into China or anything like that, how they limited it to one child. And, but it will affect the human arrangement as it is on the planet, the natural um, growth of the human uh, population. So she goes into a few other ideas, but she finally comes to one that, um, and this God of hers really likes this idea. In a way, as Aurobindo is going in through the text, he, this God likes to forget. So it, this, this God has morphed into a God that's able to not be the all-knowing, all-powerful. And in the story, he's able to forget. So that's why he's coming to Martha saying, all right, it's your turn. You try something out. Maybe you'll think of something I never did before because I thought I knew everything, but really I didn't. So she says, well, how about we give everyone on earth the power of like very lucid dreaming to the point where um and I, I recommend this to everybody here as well uh, we're also doing a uh, octavia butler reading group that'll fit in with that but i think it almost fits in with this group a little bit more especially where she goes with the the dreaming and it it, it really she does a great job exploring as Arobindo does but in in a lot simpler language going from well this might be good but then people in, in waking life would say, well, this is not um, worth living. Let me go back in the dream. Um, it almost reminded me of, this was before the prevalence of virtual reality or augmented reality. So the writer Octavia Butler didn't really know too much about that or maybe had glimpses of it. So she was really a dreamer and really thinking this could save the world. And I, after I thought about that and listened and read to this, read this story, I, I believe her. <laughs> I, I feel like dreaming will save the world. And going back to what you were saying, Lauren, it, one of the phrases she mentioned um, is um, simply something about drugs. And like, well, that that will get you into that state, but you could never return, or it's just not not real. It's not seeing both sides. And with with dreaming, at least you come out of it, and you're well, you're right back where you were. Um, but I, I found that story to be very, very enlightening. So it's called The Book of Martha. But I, it, And then at the very end, it, she's kind of overloaded with all this thought. So she says, uh, I just, can you let me forget all this? And then at the end, she's standing there and doesn't remember why she's standing there. So it's very, very cool. <laughs> Sounds like a DMT trip. It's possible. Is anyone here a Borges fan? Jorge Luis Borges? Has, has anyone read Funes the Memorious? 
Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I read that one. I know I remember the one about the library very vividly. That ah, uh, uh, the library at Babel. Yes, I remember that one. Yeah. Maybe I've read the one you were talking about. Maybe you could describe it. Funes the Memorius is this. You only meet him three times in this very short, short story. All his stories are short, but he's he has the. The, he doesn't call it a yogic power. He's lost the ability to forget. So everything he's like lived on earth for. There, you, you see him when he's 14. You see him when he's 16. You see him when he's 18. And then by 19, he's completely breaking down because every, every, every memory is an entire, whatever entire scope and spectrum. I don't know how it even makes sense, but Borges has the ability of, uh, if no one, if if not everyone's read him, Borges has the ability with any topic that he takes on to uh, to kind of play toggle between the finite and the infinite. He's actually pretty masterful at that regarding space and time and memory and uh, yeah, I don't I don't even know how to say it. Borges is really amazing at ta toggling on a very mental plane there's a yeah i don't know you'd have to kind of i know i see marco's read him too there it's a certain it's a third certain thing but with all this talk of memory in this section this short story funes the memorius kept coming up it seemed like it seems like an awful condition to not be able to forget and ha but at the same time, there's some interesting statements Sri Aurobindo made linking in memory with will in this. I can't, I can't remember. Honestly, my week has been so busy. I did read this, but it didn't penetrate below about a couple of centimeters if I was lucky. <laughs> so, but, but I just remember there's so many. And, and the beginning did was... The, the, the first nine paragraphs or so of the chapter, the knowledge and the ignorance, these paragraphs just seem Vedic to me. All the Vedic gods were coming in. The Upanishads were coming in. Yeah, and, and then this last chapter seemed so filled with a process, kind of uh, getting at using anger, I think. Was it the last chapter? Or the, yeah, it was the last chapter, using anger as a process to get at uh, these certain really difficult, for me, difficult concepts about knowledge, apprehending knowledge, objective knowledge, and he kind of uh, walks us through. But again, I, I normally, I love when I'm able to read these, our, our reading twice because it sinks a little bit deeper, but I didn't, I didn't have the bandwidth this week. I, I don't know if this is the one of the paragraphs you were talking about, but um, I'll read it. The real truth of things lies not in their process, but behind it. And whatever determines, effects or governs the process. Not in effectuation so much as in the will or power that effects. And not so much in will or power as in the consciousness of which will is the dynamic form and in the being of which power is the dynamic value. There's a lot more, so I'll stop there. I think it's always good. I, I never forget when I'm reading Sri Aurobindo that he, the, the, the power is the, is the chit shakti and, and that's the divine mother in her force of, uh, of uh, mediatrix, being the mediatrix between the, per, between the prakriti, which is the creatrix, between the, so between the creatrix and the, which, sorry, between the maya, which is the creatrix, and the prakriti, which is the executrix, is the Shakti, which is the mediatrix, all divine feminine. And Sri Aurobindo came to yoga for very non-yogic reasons. He wanted power to transform India and ended up being given something else entirely different. 
he wanted power to he wanted the power to liberate to free India from England, and his life took a very different course. He was also told that it would happen automatically, so he was able to he was he said he wasn't able to walk away from that by his own will to walk away from being a revolutionary by his own will he had to have been put into jail for sedition for a year to have the yogic realizations that all this came out of <clears throat> i want to thank you for bringing in borges i love uh i love borges i, I haven't read uh, uh much lately but uh, i had a volume called labyrinths when i was in college uh, and uh it has Miss Memorias and the uh, Library of Babel and the Garden of Forking Paths and uh, various other of his stories and circular ruins. Yeah. <laughs> that that's a, that's about the astral an astral dream, right? The guy wakes up, he he wants to meet his creator, and then he realizes that he is his creator and that he made the whole thing up, including himself, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he sort of disappears. <laughs> wow. I and think that's exactly what the this uh, secret hidden occult self knows that to some extent we've made this all up and we've sort of consented to play many different parts perhaps um, but it's a very I think it's a very theatrical cosmos <laughs> that's kind of a spooky idea I have to say and I, I you know, I, I, I read this week, this text, I think very much in a state of egoic tension. Uh, I didn't feel the access or the equanimity that's associated with the psychic being. I knew it was there. I could sort of feel it, it, it mutely from the deeper uh, dimensions of my, of my being, but I had a bit of an experience like you, Matteo, where uh, I, w in fact, was able to focus and read. And uh, I know I noticed that just having gone through these last, I guess we're 500 pages in, I've gotten to, to I've gotten, to, I've gained some capacity to kind of tune in to Aurobindo and and follow him. And and I also started the practice of numbering my paragraphs, uh, which. Uh, you suggested, Matteo, uh, and, and that's actually useful because you could chunk his arguments or his line of thinking by, by the paragraphs. Uh, and it also serves, I think, as a kind of mental marker to pause, take a breath, review what you've just read, sense deeper into it than you might if you were just reading it uh, mentally, linearly. But I want to touch on this uh, question of memory, because I was surprised by the chapter insofar as he seemed to give memory a uh, kind of short shrift. Uh, memory is about um, constructing uh, a bit of a past, a bit of a future, uh, but a very, very limited version of, of each because it's associated with the egoic uh, plane of, of consciousness. And so it's really not, it's really secondary, I think, in his view, to even the, the, the ego, which is a reference point around which memories constellate. But then to the deeper self or psychic being that uh, has access to a lot more information than the egoic memory does. But there's another sense in which uh, memory is, is um, regarded philosophically, and, and that's the platonic sense, in which memory is a memory of self. Memory is a memory of uh, psychic uh, realities or um, eternal realities. Uh, and, he, and I was surprised that uh, he didn't um, uh, sort of see it from that point of view or articulate it from, from that point of view. Uh, and 
but so so I had a maybe a, just a, a question about that. Like, what, how, how is that? Is there another sense of memory in which we're remembering the at the information? We're remembering what the occult self knows. For example, we're remembering that we made this all up, or that we set something in motion. Uh, we initiated our own forgetting, such so that later on we can pick it up. What is that kind of memory like? I'm curious. Well, I, I think the difference between the platonic forms as we're sort of traditionally introduced to them as, as separate from and better, well, it's, they're better than. That the physical is just uh, secondhand copies of these platonic forms. And that's definitely the more abstract platonic forms are. The, this transcendent realm is better than the imminent, which is, you know, changing and various and falling apart and coming together. The, the eternal transcendent realm is better. And I don't think Aurobindo goes that way. And I just wanted to, our surface, he's talking about the inner subliminal memory, which receives and records all world experience, receives and records even what the mind has not observed, understood, or noticed. Our surface imagination is a selection from a vaster, more creative and effective subliminal image building power of consciousness, a mind with immeasurably wider and more subtle perceptions, a life energy with a greater dynamism, a subtle physical substance with a larger and finer receptivity are building out of themselves our surface evolution. So these are not eternal forms just floating above us. Um, our, our the circumstances of our material worlds are in are feeding those subtle realms. And, and hopefully, if enough of us, and he's talking about the secret self, the occult self, the, these hybrids, he's calling them, the in-betweens, if there are enough of us who can surrender those walls that separate subject from object, this Cartesian kind of mental ego grid, it will be much more fluid and dynamic and nourishing for all parties concerned, um, including the ego. I don't think the ego, he's, I think he's a little harsher on the ego than I am. <clears throat> Cause I think without the ego, none of this would be going on. It, the ego is I think a tremendous achievement of, that nature has produced. And uh, you know, I, as much as we drug it and abuse it and go to psychoanalysis, and, you know, we've done all kinds of things with the ego, but it's still pretty intact. <laughs> it hasn't gone away yet. And I think there's reasons for it. I think it's just a magnificent achievement that nature has produced creatures like ourselves with these, these, this capacity for, for creating a subject object and knowing subject object. And then you, can, you are in a position to transcend subject and object. And I think this is where we can, I think what Eric Weiss says, we can start liberating the subtle realms. And this is where I think it gets all, becomes all, more than just a duty, it becomes a pleasure. <laughs> because I think there's enormous beauty that we can tap into. And um, I mean, I'm sure it's some of us, we've seen, we've seen glimpses of this, but it, they van it vanishes very quickly in our, in our waking sort of cultural trance. Um, but I think we can, cultivate practices and reading is one of the big ones I think that taps into these hidden uh, occult selves if you get the right literature at the right time or the right poem at the right time you just then oh yeah I know this it's been there all along but you just sort of needed that 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 poem or that um, that movie at that right time to unlock that hidden knowledge. Uh, a short note about memory that came to my mind when I was hearing what you were, were saying, Marco. There is also somewhere where Sri Aurobindo says that the supramental being, uh, what he calls a Gnostic being, will have no memory at all, at least not that kind of memory that we uh, think of. Huh? And this was 
somehow a bit frightening for me because uh, we also say we lose memory. It's, it's, it does not have a positive connotation. So it's this Gnostic being uh, uh, is supposedly divine and all powerful, all omniscient and so on, but has no memory at all. Uh, it is a state of being that, okay, I would say, uh, I would think about twice before becoming such divine being. Eh? But uh, maybe we are looking at these things from the human uh, perspective and we are so attached to our egos and to our minds and to our memories that we cannot even imagine what it means to have a, a divine knowledge which does not need any memory at all. So just a little anecdote. Uh, I think you can I think you can safely forget when you've resolved it. When you've resolved that knot in the heart mm -hmm. and you've untied it, then you can forget it safely. Otherwise you're just going to end up repeating it. Um and I just wanted to I'm just getting this flash. Um, the what? What? um me... sort of like uh I met my father my de my deceased father on the road, and instead of um, spitting on him or slapping him the way he spit on and slapped me when I was a child, I, you know, just sat with him, and felt sad. And I felt like that was sort of not anything the ego planned or his ego, but I think there was something about, and I wasn't forgiving him, because I've tried that before and it doesn't work. But I, as, I, as I shared that dream and as I reflect a little bit, what, what this line has been coming through my head over and over again. Shakespeare, um, Portia, um, that big scene between her and Shylock. And uh, Shylock has the law on his side. And uh, he's going to you know, kill someone because he broke a contract and he has the law on his side. And she says, well, yeah, you have the law on your side. Therefore, you must be merciful. And he says, why do I have to be merciful? And she says that great speech, the quality of mercy is not strain. It droppeth like the gentle rain from heaven under the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest and the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. So I feel like that line of Shakespeare and that dream last, this is two nights ago. I feel like something like mercy, not forgiveness which I tried that Christian thing, it just does, it fell flat every time. But that mercy is something that, that yeah, you know, I can, ha I, I can add that. And it's sort of, I can then just be sad, but I don't feel like I have to be plugged into this abusive cycle and ultimately self-rejection over and over again. I just make myself feel miserable. Um, but I think we all have that creative capacity when we, you know, start, reading the right stuff and listening to the right music and tuning into the right poetry of loosening up these, these splits in our psyche. And I think that's what that um, G space that I, I was trying to draw in my diagram. I think that the G space and it corresponds to something that Aurobindo said in that passage that I quoted earlier about having contact with this uh, much faster intelligence. So anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> um, I liked what you were saying, Marco, about memory. And uh, it, it made me think like, well, how do we define memory? And somebody earlier on, um, weeks and weeks ago, had mentioned reading um, the book, The Whole Brain Child. And I've been delving into that and then their other book recently. And one of the things it was saying pretty sure I got it from there, was about how memories are formed and how we, how we recall a memory um, literally depends upon the state of mind you're in at that moment. So you could be really happy and recall something in a totally positive light, even though it was like an awful experience or something. Um, 
And so you connect, you, you end up changing your memories throughout the course of your life based on how you like interpret them in those moments. And so it makes memory kind of a, a very relative thing and question like, well, what, what is fact from history? What, what actually did happen? And um, so if we're trying to think of memory as far as like the, the one that like all cosmic being having no memory, it doesn't seem so strange when you think about that being the way that we form memories. Like, okay, well, of course it wouldn't have memory in our sense of memory. Um, it kind of reminds me of like the Akashic Records or then like I mentioned earlier, DMT. I had a, my one experience on DMT, the beginning of it, my physical reality changed. It became like this giant ripple, like everything, the fabric of time and space was like moving at me and it was so intense. I had never seen physical reality change like that that I start crying and then I let go of that fear and just like let it wash over me. I don't know if anyone's read Carlos Castaneda, but it reminded me of what he said about how like when he was in the presence of the one that the power of it was like this fireball just like hitting him over and over and over again. It was like the power of creation and destruction that he was witnessing. And so so then as I let it come over me, suddenly I was like traveling through this wormhole that was like my spirit's existence or whatever in this plane beyond. Um, and next thing I know, there was like an infinite amount of symbols all passing me by in this wormhole. And I could see myself in there. And it, it started to appear to me as if those symbols were all the memories and the knowledge that I had, not the memories, but the knowledge that Mommy. I had like, gotten Mommy, through my experiences. Okay, in a minute. And, and that those, then it, then it became like Akashic Records, like I wasn't just seeing all of the knowledge from my experiences in my life, but it was like the entirety of the universe, and it was so much, like it was just this infinite amount, that there was no way that you could, that anyone could remember it. It just was. Um, like you can't, I know everybody that I've talked to has come out of a DMT experience and they're like, I can't tell you what happened. Mommy. Like, I can't remember any Mommy. of that really in, in a particular way, you know, like being able to see details and stuff. So that's what I think when maybe we're talking about no memory in that realm and what that means. Yes, yes, I, I think uh, one point, okay. Uh, suppose you you can hear it nevertheless but um, one point is also of course what we mean by memory yeah that's uh, the, the, okay in, in a so-called altered state of consciousness uh, memory may um, reach a completely different me may have a completely different meaning yeah? but let's suppose that we don't need memory at all. We are in a state of consciousness where we don't need memory. Mem we are in every, at every moment we are. And there is no need to remember what was in the past and there is no need to uh, try to infer what will happen in the future. So in, if you are in this perfect state, you simply don't need memory. And the first reaction that I had when I read this is that if I lose my memory, even in this altered state of consciousness, when you take some drugs and so on, and you have these visions, you always relate them, I suppose. Somehow, there is always this uh, diff different separation between past, present, and future. Whereas here, you're in a state of consciousness where you really don't need such a thing. You, you even forget what you have said a second prior. Uh, in a, you're in a state of consciousness where if you're someone would ask you, what did you do 10, set, ten uh, seconds before, uh, you don't know. 
because you don't need to know, because you know exactly what you have to do from time to time, from step to step, from the now into the future. So memory, maybe, maybe if you're, and that, that's what you also mentioned, in this state of consciousness, maybe you are in contact with these Akashic records. This is the only rem memory which remains, and what, which is all the memory of the universe. So <laughs> it might be a good deal after all. Um, but uh, uh, okay, here I should again find the passage where he, I'm, I'm trying to rephrase this in my words. And, but we associate to memory, fortunately, usually not always, but usually some positive emotional state of being. And we like to repeat this memory in our mind. But in that state of consciousness, you are no longer allowed to repeat the state of you are always in the present. And you obey only a divine impulse, so to speak. And if you are in the state of perfect knowledge, you don't need memory because you know exactly what you have to do at each instant. And therefore, the use of memory, memory becomes useless. Okay. Okay, but this is well, wanted only to be an anecdote and it may be only important in 500 years when we have the Gnostic beings uh, walking around or flying around somewhere. I, I could share a, a, a bit of gossip. Uh, it's old, <laughs> so, so it should be beyond statute of limitations um, as far as karma, I hope. Uh, but it's about Eckhart Tolle. So I knew somebody who worked with him and they were doing an audio production or something like that. And, you know, he's the power of now guy. Um, but she had worked with him multiple times. They had met, had conversations. And uh, she was a bit upset because after, you know, three or four times of having met, uh, he didn't remember her. <laughs> he didn't remember her name. He acted as if she had seen her for the first time. And... Uh, she didn't. Uh, she didn't appreciate that, <laughs> actually. So uh, there is, I think, a utility and a use and an importance to the relative egoic level, conventional uh, consensus reality uh, dimension of memory. And I can relate all to what to that fear that you you expressed regarding this potential state of being without memory of the infinite, the, the Gnostic being. Uh, and it reminded me of a thought experiment or exercise that I just spontaneously did as, as I was reading it because I, I, I think I sensed something similar myself. And, and also with regard to this idea that um, some other version or some deeper version of myself set this, in, this universe in motion and, and here I am struggling in it and, you know, uh, suffering, but if I only could return to remember that part of myself that um, chose uh, to create this, I would feel better, perhaps. But I tried to imagine, what if that was my mind? What if I was in that mind where this particular self, this egoic self, Marco Morelli, uh, really was so far, you know, so minuscule? Uh, such a forgettable <laughs> event in the sweep of, of cosmic history, would I be okay with that? Uh, what would become of my various projects and responsibilities and commitments and obligations and um, desires and everything that I've invested into this particular life, if I were just to forget it, if it were just to disappear into the you know, infinitude of the plenum of time. Uh, I have to admit, I, 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 I like having a self. <laughs> and I think that there's a reason we have individual, individualized egoic selves. And of course, I mean, it could become, uh, you know, being a self could entail a lot of suffering and a lot of discord and a lot of problem. But 
why would we have manifested if not to be who we are? And so I, I, I think this ties back also to something you were talking about, Lauren, with respect to like just losing yourself in other realms, other shards of, of the psyche and the danger of that, particularly with psychedelic experiences, but that can also come through other forms of psychosis or through, um, you know, meditation that isn't, you know, that, that isn't um, balanced uh, by um, healthier, you know, practices or relationships and so forth. Um, I, I, I think that the solution to this, at least in Aurobindo, comes with the psychic being because the psychic being is still an individualized being. It's still myself, yourself. However, it has this coordinating role so that it has a pers perspective of the ego. It also can access subliminal uh, and other kinds of information. And I think that maybe that's the, the, the balance or the membrane between the infinite and the finite. I'm still working on understanding this uh, and I would like to experience more of the psychic self and, and a little bit less of the egoic self. I, I don't want to lose the egoic self, but I'd, I'd like to be able to relax a bit more so that there's less um, seeming uh, tension or, or uh, 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 dis alienation between the individualized, the sensed individualized self and that deeper self. But there is some fear there around what losing all of that you think that you are. Well, <clears throat> that was fascinating. I, I have not done, I've done a little bit of drugs, but not DMT. But um, I've read Strasbourg's book, I think, Strassman's book on DMT, and um, how it's a lot like lucid dreaming. Evidently, the chemistry of the brain is very similar. Um, but I think that, um, I, ha I took care of an old lady. She was in her 90s and she had dementia. And I saw her, her autobiographical memory over the five years I took care of her, I saw it, it drop away, but her episodic memory was still there. So a few weeks before she died, we took her out dancing. I took her to Fred Astaire's studio. She could do the waltz, the cha-cha, you know, the tango. Her episodic memory was intact, um, but her autobiography was gone. You know, she would ask me, are we married? You know, what's our relationship? You know, she knew she loved me and I loved her, but she didn't know about what the history was of our relationship. And she was constantly, almost every day, asking me to reconstruct it. Um, and I made up things at a certain point. I just, to keep myself entertained, I would create a different history all the time. Um, but I think something Aurobindo says about the personality and memory. And he says, as when a man in the state of hypnosis takes up a range of memories and experiences to which his waking mind is a stranger, but does not therefore think himself another person, or as when who, one has forgotten the past events of his life, and perhaps even his name, still does not change his ego sense and personality. So I was very aware of my, my dear friend, I love her dearly, she passed away about two years ago, um, right to the end, you know, I could tell there was the ego, her ego was still there and active and processing. And she wanted things. She was dealing with desire, you know. And uh, she loved me and she hated me. And she thought I was her boyfriend sometimes. Sometimes I was her father. So I was just, uh, you know, like a chameleon in, in a way. I just would change colors, whatever was in the background, you know. So I think those, so we can remember, we can remember um, I, the, the Kashuk records and we can remember things beyond our lifetime. I sort of entertained myself with these questions. Um, before we started today, as I started thinking about it, that dream I had with my father and that the, the repeated word Gettysburg. And, I, and then I saw some scenes from a, a battle. Um, and I'm, you know, who knows? We may, we may have those memories, but they may not be ego-based memories. Um, we may have species memories. Um, you know, and we have, may, we have mem memories of other, being other species. I asked myself these questions. How old could myself be? How old could the world be? How old could the relationship between the world and myself be? 
So I think, you know, the kind of questions we ask ourselves can sometimes put us into a trance state um, that can make us a little more tuned in to these affective fields um, rather than that ego grid, which puts everything into, well, what do, you know, what do I want? And how, do, how am I going to get it? And how am I going to manipulate events um, to get this? Um, so anyway, just sh sharing that as we're talking about memory and what a, a mystery it is and where is the memory? Whereabouts is it? Um, that's a, a profound mystery. I like what you're saying about like species memory and things like that. It, it makes me think then like, okay, like the brain and the limbic system and the instinctual kind of thing, like that is, a, is in some ways maybe like a form of memory. Um, and then like they say that traumatic experiences can also end up being like passed down genetically. Um, maybe I'm not saying that well enough, but something like, um, yeah, like PTSD kind of things that like that, especially if it happens like generationally, it becomes a part of that child and that next generation. Um, I think within like the study of epigenetics, perhaps we can rewire ourselves um, and be able to heal from those traumatic experiences. But it's interesting then when we think like, you know, that I have memories from my ancestors that are stored like in my cells. It's not the same kind of like active memory that I can like recall it. Um, it's like a, on a genetic level. Um, it's like, like the fact that we existed as an egg inside our mother when she was an embryo inside your grandmother's. <laughs> you know, like that kind of level of connection uh, upon generations and that kind of memory. Yes, in fact, I think that we there are very different types of memories. I think uh, all the time we were speaking about the memories of uh, of which we have more or less a direct conscious, direct um, access. But there, are, I think, we are mostly guided by subconscious memories, cellular memories, memories in the cells of our body, and which most probably uh, contain also memories of our ancestors and so on. But the point is also what the, 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 the utility of memory. I liked, I liked, I like you, the, the, the story of uh, Eckhart Tolle and Marco that you brought up because <laughs> I have more or less the same problem. I forget names, I forget faces, and it can be quite embarrassing in several occasions. So if also Eckhart Tolle has this problem, this um, comforts me somehow. Uh, but... Uh, these is kind of, so to speak, deficits uh, that sometimes I think maybe sound, it may sound as a, an excuse now, but it, it is maybe also an excuse. But I think sometimes some memories which are extremely important for some people are no longer, so have no longer that utility for others. Uh, it, what kind of memory is really essential for someone at this, in a certain environment and for some occasions depends also from the state of consciousness. And when you look at the events in your life and also in the, in, in, at the events that surround you, the people, the persons, 
you may record uh, some type of information which are much more relevant relevant uh, than other informations that are maybe super superficial for um, and and others uh, consider extremely relevant um, for example i don't know but sometimes i don't see people for what they say what they look like and not what for their face and for their name but for how they think huh? or for how they feel you record this information and you have a certain type of memory of that person whereas if you're in another state of consciousness where maybe if you're not you're not so concentrated let's put it in that way you just see the person for what uh, he or she says nothing else and that's the very different types of information and when you have to retrieve some um, details which are mental which which are superficial details and other are a very can retrieve these details very easily uh, if you we're not on the same level of consciousness or from the, looked at the scenes from the same perspective of others. You can notice that you have recorded very different things what others have, than, than what others have recorded. And there some problem can, can arise in this sense. I don't know, it's maybe it was a bit confusing <laughs> what I was, but what I wanted to say, what we memorize depends also from our state of consciousness. At some state of consciousness, some sort of memory is not so essential, but is much more essential other types of memories. I think we remember, it depends on what state we're in. So I understand they've done studies on the memory with, um, they would have college students memorize stuff when they were drunk mm. and they could only recall the information when they were drunk. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there were small enough amounts of alcohol that they were, they were sober enough, I suppose, to remember. But um, there's something about state-dependent memory um, that I think is uh, really important. So when you're in an ecstatic state, you're gonna remember certain things. And when you're in a, a depressed state, you're gonna remember certain things. And so ecstasy, ecstatic states, and depression can bring up different kinds of memories, uh, can be associated. But I, I, as we've been talking about Eckhart Tolle, I, I listened to a, a psychologist say that she believed he had autism um, because she said uh, she was with a large group of people and they'd been there many, many hours. And uh, everyone was exhausted, wanted to go home except for him. <laughs> he wouldn't stop talking. And she said he thought, she thought he was extremely dissociated from the, the affective zones that most people are in. Um, but he's right, you know, he's definitely articulate kind of guy. Um, but I think the, um, um, this, this challenge of translating between these different, um, these different fields and when we're in the field and get lost in the field and then we come back um, to that sort of ordinary centered self and we can't, and it's just on the tip of our tongue that we've lost it. I think that's a, a big frustration, but I think we can practice um, bringing back certain kind from those liminal zones and it can become a very refined skill. And I think the yogis do this and lucid dreamers do this and meditators do this because I think they chunk down and they are able to get into those very slow kind of uh, rhythms rather than that, that fast, very chatty um, rhythm that our waking lives are so immersed in. So I think there's lots of hope that we can, if we, if we really start paying attention to how we're using our attention, we can um, start to contact this, 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 uh, this hidden occult uh, self, which has access to so much more than our egos do. So thanks. Yeah, uh, I like what you've been saying about the, the value that you personally, John, are finding in the, the material and the psychic and the integration. And then 
the half asleep, half awake, and the the various different states. And with with the memory, each we we can view each individual, even our worst enemy or least favorite person we can think of, as as crucial as um, their own individual um, part, playing their part in the the great cosmic game, I suppose. Uh, and it's good to remember that even the, the autistic child has something to offer if we spend enough time to sit and listen or the autistic tole. Um, but, and then we go back to our ancestors or our non-ancestors, even, even a, a bottle is made up of 70, this one probably has 70% water just as I do right now, um, or however much the percentage is, I forget. But there's, there's a lot to, in the past to reflect on as to where we came from. Uh, one of the thoughts I had a few sessions back was if we were to be the, the drippings from this Satchit Ananda and, and coming out of that, that I don't even remember if it's evolution now or involution, it's all come kind of fusing together. But if we were the, the waves and then the atoms and we're, we're all a part of that, um, and that that's our ancestry as well and it's not where we're so human focused even if we say well we have animal instincts but, but before that maybe we have the instincts of a amoeba which it's always got to move it always has to engulf something um to incorporate it into its being and and also have to become something more um so there's microcosmos uh, and that, that's one aspect of our Obindo, which I, I know we're only halfway through, and I know I, I've read the book, I know how it ends, but there's, it, there's, I, I, I struggle, which I know I don't have to, but I struggle with this human focus or this focus on the self uh, at times that our Obindo has. But then at the same time, that's, that's who we are, that's what we have to do. I wanted to say something about attention, r responding to, to Marco and, uh, and, and memory formation in relation to attention. As you described interacting with people and in one state of mind or with one kind of attention, uh, just seeing them as some kind of talking heads and uh, personalities or uh, in some way, conventional or known quantities, but then with another kind of attention, uh, tuning in to some other aspect of what they're about, maybe not even necessarily what they personally are about, but what they're communicating or how they are uh, playing a role, like I think Doug was saying, in a deeper story, that because you're paying that kind of attention is unfolding for you in a way that the, the merely mental kind of categorizing type of attention doesn't really, um, it doesn't really get, doesn't really feel, doesn't, isn't really uh, attuned with. I think that, that that's an interesting thing because like the, the example of Tole, uh, he has such wisdom to offer and that's why he was so successful is because he was such a clear channel for this transcendent timeless, immutable self aspect of the divine. Um, but in a way, there's room there still for a critique of the way that that state or that particular um, mode of consciousness is valorized and the, um, the kind of regular everyday capacity to remember, you know, so somebody who you've met a few times uh, 
is seen as lower spiritually somehow. Uh, that's, you know, maybe not uh, uh, that, that, that wise of a, of a perspective. You know, maybe we can have a, a better balance between the transcendental and the imminent or the infinite and, and the finite. I mean, this, I think, is the integral. This is what Aurobindo is, is talking about. I think it's why he doesn't want to say uh, that our waking life is an illusion. He wants to say that it's real. And because if it's real, then we can do something meaningful with it. We can take responsibility for it in some way. We could uh, uh, envision a better way of, that things could be arranged. Uh, one, one thing that he says at the beginning of this chapter, these chapters, which I think was really poignant, was that some, he, he, he says that some people just give up on the notion that the human experiment, the human uh, aspiration could be achieved. Uh, that basically they, they want to say, well, no, it's all perpetual chaos at some level. It's all ultimately, you know, either illusory or um, stained with uh, error uh, from, from the beginning and eternally. But I think what's hopeful uh, and about this text is that he's affirming a different possibility. He's affirming uh, th that we could do something with our actuality and that that can be continuous with the, um, the transcendental being uh, for whom it is all just more of its, it's all just itself. It's all, it's all not, it's, it's not uh, um, ultimately real. Yeah, sure. Uh, Sri Aurobindo was certainly not uh, an illusionist in the in the sense of the Vedanting of the uh, non-dual Vedanta. He frequently says that he uh, um, keeps distant from an exclusive Vedantic point of view. Uh, uh, yes, in this sense, I agree. Uh, no, but uh, one point, perhaps that I might add about the fact that um, about the autism or supposed mental Ill illness of Eckhart Tolle and so on. There is an interesting point that also Sri Aurobindo makes about not autism, because I don't think at those times, I don't even know if autism was known and as such as we know it today, but uh, he speaks about schizophrenia. Uh, and someone asked him uh, if he, what he describes in his writing uh, uh, is a perfect, uh, <laughs> he, he, someone objected that it, it is a description of someone who is schizophrenic. And he confirmed that. He confirmed that and, that, and said, yes, in a certain sense, uh, the yogi, uh, the yogi is someone who is schizophrenic, but the difference is that he knows that he's schizophrenic, whereas the, schizo the clinical schizophrenic does not know it, does, has not this consciousness that he is schizophrenic. I, I don't recall now exactly, I, I, if I'm not mm, mistaken, I, he was describing the mm, perception of time, huh? the Trikala Drishti that also Debashish uh, was hinting at. And this kind of uh, time perception I'm not a psychologist, but it seems that it is, uh, it is very similar to the description of time that uh, schizophrenic people uh, uh, described. So uh, it is very difficult to have an idea where the, uh, the limits are, where we have to say where the borders are. Uh, in a certain sense, it is about bringing to the surface something that is already there, but consciously, not by a casual uh, serendipitous process that can happen uh, in every one of us. But if it happens too soon, it has probably not positive effects.
if the being instead is prepared to get in contact to these realms, then it can fuse this reality, this physical reality, the dream state reality, and other uh, realities. Uh, Shribuno called it the planes and parts of the being, uh, where all these planes and parts must be prepared uh, and then integrated. Uh, then we can become autistic and schizophrenic by will without harm. Uh, so <laughs> that's my words, obviously. Well, you know, memory is so tricky, but I, I remember my first memory was when I, I sort of constructed this, I must have been about two years old. But I remember I was in, in a dark room by myself and it was daytime because I could see the slats and the blinds. There was light pouring in. And I remember looking at the dust floating in the shafts of light. And I asked the question, I said, how did I get here? And I remember there was this, it was a very like, oh, I, it was almost as if I just woke, woken up from a very weird dream. How did I get here in this dark room the shaft of light and this dust floating in it. And, you know, I, then lots of other things happened. You know, I grew up and I got enculturated and had all kinds of experiences. And then I started to, uh, in my 20s, you know, got into meditation. I had some traumatic episodes um, that really put a halt to a lot of my ego initiatives. I saw, I, I realized there were a lot of things that were going on besides my ego. And I had some psychic experiences and some lucid dreams and out-of-body experiences and some really weird stuff. And when I went into those other states of consciousness, I started to realize, oh, now I remember how I got there <laughs> when I was asking that question two years old. Um, but I think that's when you get, I think that the G space, what do you know from G? You know about A, B, C, D, E, F, and C. You, you remember all those spaces. And you, and you do remember how you got there. Um, but I think this has a much richer and deeper and expansive memory than C does with its access to these sensory motor kind of operations and with these very simple causes and effects. Because the psychic being and the, the psychic being in the G space, they're not about cause and effect in a material world. They're, this is all about ends and means. And I think that's something, that's a very different kind of um, dimension. And I think that's what this book is all about. So, yeah, and I think you can burn, you can, um, you know, burn, burn out and you can, um, have these kundalini kind of experiences that create all kinds of spiritual emergencies. So I think a, a, a strong grounded ego is, is very useful. Um, and I think the drug experiences can be fascinating, but we all know it can be very destructive for some persons who may be very fragile and get lost in the field. So it's a great adventure, right? I would like to bring attention to this last paragraph of uh, chapter uh, eight, which is about time. And I thought it was just a fantastic paragraph uh, from a literary you know, point of view. I gave it a big star and underlined it, but- it, Could you read it? I definitely will. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it really brought uh, Jean Gebser to mind. Uh, and the, the idea of time freedom uh, that he has and talks about an ever-present origin. And um, it's funny too, it was a bit unexpected because he equates time with a kind of money here. He talks about it in terms of a coin. Uh, so this is paragraph 13. Time is the great bank of conscious existence turned into the values of experience and action. 
The surface mental being draws upon the, fast, the past and the future also and coins it continually into the present. He accounts for and stores up the gains he has gathered in what we call the past, not knowing however present the, is the past in us. He uses as much of it as he needs as coin of knowledge and realized being and pays it out as coin of mental, vital, and physical action in the commerce of the present, which creates to his view the new wealth of the future. Ignorance is a utilization. Stop, stop for yeah. just a second, just a second. This sentence you're about to read, starting with ignorance, going down to the end of causality, he added this in 1940. So you've been reading... Just, just so you just add a little bit more. That's, that's interesting. I, I just want to pause even there because okay. I underlined the next sentence. And I think it's really interesting how he um, uh, equates memory with a, a kind of wealth that one has. And it's both a memory of past events and also an anticipation or an imagination of future events. It's, it's a wealth that one has in the present, which the ego self, the ig ignorant aspect of being, uses to conduct its commerce with the world. So there's something that is, um, I mean, I think this is why we read literature. This is why we want to learn. This is that we're, we're, gathering, um, we're gathering material to construct the future, to envision the future. So I, I really thought that was interesting but I'll continue and uh, complete the paragraph. Uh, ignorance is a utilization of the being's self-knowledge in such a way as to make it valuable for time experience and valid for time activity. What we do not know is what we have not yet taken up, coined and used in our mental experience or have ceased to coin or use. Behind all is known and all is ready for use according to the will of the self in its dealings with time and space and causality. One might almost say that our surface being is only the deeper eternal self in us, throwing itself out as the adventurer in time, a gambler and speculator in infinite possibilities, limiting itself to the succession of moments so that it may have all the surprise and delight of the adventure, keeping back its self-knowledge and complete self-being so that it may win again what it seems to have lost, reconquering all itself through the checkered joy and pain of an aeonic passion and seeking and endeavor. Quite an addition to the text there. Just that one sentence, or the two sentences from ignorance to causality is, is what he added. The rest was from the original 19, 1916 or whenever it came in. Hmm. I think it's brilliant because he's saying that we make ourselves poorer than we really are. Uh, and that we do that for the sake of this adventure, for the sake of this lila, this uh, delight, or, you know, the, the, the... I don't know, you know, uh, whether to believe that or not. I think, in a way, this is kind of a mythic or mythological kind of uh, element to, to the thinking. This is a way of telling a story about why we're here. Um, but... It's a, it's a, it, it, from an aesthetic point of view, if nothing else, I think it's, a, it's an attractive story. Um, and, and particularly this notion of playing with infinite possibilities and the, the, so the commerce, you know, in this coin of the past, the present, and the future. Um, and that there's a lot more where that came from, <laughs> right? Uh, I think that that's... Uh, um, it struck me as uh, um, a beautiful passage, um, and but also as having a real insight into this nature of time. Uh, that I think that 
you know, as I hover in my own awareness and my attention, sometimes I glimpse that. Sometimes I experience that more, um, uh, you know, more fluidly. Um, and other times it feels like, you know, I, I just have this little sack of change and I have a hole in my pocket and the money is falling out and <laughs> it's all going to run out and I'm going to die. Um, so uh, I'm very much appreciating this reading. And uh, I know we're reaching kind of the top of the hour. So I'll, those will be my last words for, for tonight. And a word of gratitude for all of you for uh, reading together. Um, you brought up Gebser, and I just, I've been thinking about him throughout the course of this as well. And the idea that even each and every moment, the entirety of the past and all the possibilities of the future are there, present within us, and like to, to work through with our ego through that somehow, um, understanding time in that way becomes, I don't know, to me it's like everything is exactly like as it's supposed to be and i have the free will to use my ego to choose out of those possibilities what's going to come next can't choose everything but it opens up this awareness and like it's a different kind of memory again that when we talk about the entirety of the past being present within us so yeah <laughs> those will be my last words too Thanks, you guys. It's been a good one. I want to double down on the gratitude that Marco and Lauren expressed, triple down on it. I appreciate reading. Even though we're not reading together, I, I love it when someone does choose to read a paragraph and I appreciate everyone's personal sharings and musings and yeah, thank you. Well, this is like a dream come true for me. I've wanted to read this text for years and I can kept putting it off. I tried and I put it back down and I think about two, was it two years ago, Marco, we started talking about the possibility of doing a reading group around Life Divine. Mm -hmm. And I kept plugging it. Let's do it. Let's do it. But we did a lot of other things like Schlatter Dyke and Gebser. And but always in the back of my mind, there was this, I really want to get around to doing Life Divine. And so it's happening. And I think it's a co-creation and we're co-facilitating. And I, I think that's where the, the rubber meets the road, because I think it's a, it's a collaborative process that we're engaged in. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm reading this text with you guys rather than trying to struggle with it on my own. Although I'm sure I would have enjoyed it on my own. And I know I can, after having this group read, go back to it on my own. But I think there's something really exciting about, you know, going into these liminal zones with one another and trying to, to read it together. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to take my stable mind with me into any possible experience um, that I can. Um, this conversation in particular was and is amazing. So thank you. Thank you very much to you all also because I appreciate in general that these sessions exist because it is difficult to find people with whom to discuss these kind of topics. So whatever we, we discuss or will discuss about Sri Aurobindo and so I will be glad to participate even if the time it's between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. It's not <laughs> it's really hard. That's also why sometimes I skip because I, 
I don't hear the ring, the ring of my smartphone ringing or I fall asleep again uh, as the last time. And fortunately, I have not to go to, to work tomorrow, today. Uh, but at any rate, I think this is a great initiative, uh, these sessions about the life divine, and I hope they will continue. Thank you. So I guess we can say uh, good night to you too, Marco, instead of uh, good morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, good morning, but good sleep. Sleep well. Eh? <laughs> I, I hope. Appreciate your contributions, Marco. So I thank you for staying up during yeah. these hours thank to you. join us. That's dedication. We appreciate it. Yeah, I don't know if my mind and my memory is, uh, <laughs> but okay. Nevertheless, it's it's also a test. You you see if you're really interested in something or not. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you don't wake up for this. <laughs> I'll be in your time zone in one month. I'll be in your time zone for two months. And I don't, I've been questioning whether or not I'll be able to do it, but you're inspiring me to try. Matteo, I don't know if, okay, this, for, I sent you an email two, three weeks ago. So did you read it? I'll check on it. I've been in yeah. the cat skills and so be just buried in everything. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll email you back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, no, yeah. No, that's not Sorry. a problem. But no, yeah. no, no, I don't need uh, an answer because I answered your question, so it's okay. I remember you wrote it and I don't remember what you said. Something with ah. memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good night, everyone. Right. Good night, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Cheers.